Okay, so today in our video we're going to be talking about natural selection. We're going to figure out how species are created through natural selection and through isolation. We're going to talk about how traits are specific to their environment and how, um, how traits are going to be selected for by different pressures in the environment. So in class we did this lab with uh, bird beak shape and utensils. Um, to collect beans so you could see how um, as we went on through the different uh, generations different traits were selected for being more uh, favorable for the environment than others so for example chopsticks did really poorly but spoons typically did really well um, so this was helpful to kind of model uh, natural selection so natural selection pretty much what's happening is we are taking a bunch of different traits, a bunch of different alleles in the environment, and we are putting them against natural pressure. So predators, um, environmental factors like temperature or rainfall, um, and we are selecting for the trait that is going to work best in that environment. So you can see these beetles, they have green or brown versions. This brown one could have been a mutation originally. Um, they could have all been green and some mutation caused a couple of them to be brown. The crows decided that they really liked the taste of the green ones. So over time, the selection pressure is going to cause more browns to be produced than greens. And in the end, only green or only brown individuals are produced. Obviously, they're more beneficial to their environment. This could be due to their coloration if they blend in better. Um, this could be due to some sort of um, toxin or poisonous chemical in them that makes them unedible or inedible for the crows or the crows may just have a food preference for the green beetles than the brown ones. So natural selection is the idea that the best fit traits survive to pass on those traits. So this means that the ones that have the higher reproductive or how have a higher um, survival chance are going to be more likely to reproduce um, and the traits are going to be caused by these really random mutations. We talked about mutations in genetics in the last unit. Um, mutations are going to cause these traits to be created so they have to be in the gametes of our offspring or in of ourselves so that we can pass those favorable traits on to the new offspring. So random mutations have to occur in the gametes. So take a minute, um, there is a game linked on Schoology. Take a couple minutes and tie in uh, what did we learn in this game? What did we just learn about natural selection? How do they kind of tie in together? Okay, so hopefully you played this game. This game is about peppered moths. This was an experiment done back in the Industrial Revolution when um, civilization started to build factories and mass produce things. They determined that, or at first, um, the environment was very light. We had a lot of birch trees um, in this area that um, had very light backgrounds. So all of the moths had light backgrounds, or light wing color. So over time, as smoke and smog and soot begins, was beginning to be produced, it started to turn all of the leaves and all of the bark black. And what this did was it forced the moth to adapt to its environment. It started, to, it gained a random mutation that allowed it to uh, develop dark wings. So the dark winged individuals were better able to blend in with their environment than the light winged individuals. So over time, the black ones became more common to the light ones. This is going to lead us into isolation. So isolation, you may have uh, remember back during COVID. Isolation was when we were locked inside of our house, houses. Um, we couldn't go outside, we couldn't interact with people. Um, so isolation is the process of separating it from the rest of the population. Um, so we're gonna look into the different mechanisms of isolation and how that allows different species to be produced. And the, first, or the different types we have, so we have isolation, we have genetic drift, we have a founder's effect, and we have migration. Isolation, is, like I said, separation from the rest of the population. So this could be in the form of geographic isolation, reproductive isolation, or temporal isolation. Geographic isolation is going to be separated by physical barriers. So things like mountains, uh, rivers, canyons, uh, even things like human-made structures, cities, 
highways. Um, species are going to be separated because the population cannot physically cross that barrier. So if we have a species of squirrel that's stuck on one side of a river, a species of squirrel that's stuck on the other side, or that same species is stuck on the other side of the river, we're going to have two different conditions that are going to cause different changes to happen in both squirrels. Reproductive isolation is that species are going to re or aren't going to be able to reproduce with other non-related species. We usually measure species as one specific organism that can interbreed with other members of that uh, organism. So if we try to cross, let's say, a donkey with a horse, we get a mule. Mules aren't found in nature. They are hybrids, and the mules are sterile. They aren't able to have offspring. We saw hybridization in the last unit. But Reproductive isolation can also relate to things like courtship. So um, animals trying to find significant others, find, trying to find mates. Some of them use calls like birds. Others will use elaborate dances. Um, and if they aren't attracted to that dance, they're going to be less likely to breed with that uh, organism. So they're going to diverge into two different species. The last one, temporal isolation. Temporal is time. So temporal could be different seasons. If you breed during the spring versus during the uh, fall, if you breed as well as uh, during the night versus the day. So we've got these two skunks over here. One of them breeds during the day. The other one is more active at night. So it's going to be more likely to breed during that time. So looking at this image, um, what type of isolation is occurring? We have Galapagos finches that have, after they came to the Galapagos Islands, they developed different mating calls. So this one makes a very harsh call. The ground finch over here makes a chirp. So take a minute, based on what we just talked about with isolation, what type of isolation is occurring here? Okay, so this is reproductive isolation. We have these two different species that the call is going to attract the other gender of that bird. So we've got a uh, cactus finch over here. It will make a call to attract other cactus finch. If we use that cactus finch call on a ground finch, it's not going to come to it. It's like speaking a foreign language. It's not going to want to come to that call, so it's going to ignore it. The second example, we have a population of gray tree frogs. You can actually find these gray tree frogs in the, uh, Pennsylvania. But these are going to be preyed upon by a predator that only hunts at night. So what happens is we have organisms that start to diversify. We have individuals that have bright colors start to become more active during the day. And individuals that have this darker gray black color are going to be more likely to become active at night. So take a minute, what type of isolation is occurring here? So this is uh, temporal isolation. So we've got two different times, either the day or the night, and based on whether they come out during the day or coming out during the night, it's going to depend or it's going to challenge when they are able to breed. So these light ones are going to breed during the day, so only lighter individuals are going to be bred that way. These dark ones are only going to breed during the night, so they only interact with other gray ones. So that's going to potentially cause speciation between these two. The third one is actually a real example. We have a the slow development of this Grand Canyon, if you've been to the Grand Canyon. Um, it causes a population of squirrels to develop into two unique species. We have these kaibab squirrels that live on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, and we have these abert squirrels that live on the south rim, and you only find one of these two species at each site. So take a minute, what type of isolation is occurring here? Okay, this is geographic isolation. So we've got this giant landmark, the Grand Canyon, and the squirrels obviously can't get across this Grand Canyon, so they have to diversify based on their, uh, based on their environment at the time. So 
Uh, Kaibab squirrels are much more brown to blend in with the trees. Aberth squirrels kind of have this grayish color and a bit pointier ears. The last one, another real example, we have these birds of paradise. These are found in New Guinea, um, down by Australia, and they developed a special dance that they used to court females. So these birds will fluff up their wings, show off this bright blue color and their yellow mouths to try and dance around and attract females. So a dance that is passed down, this is a dance that's passed down from parent to offspring but it doesn't interest the whole population. You've got some that are attracted to this new dance, while some in uh, some of the older generations may have used a older dance. So because of these, this change in dances, some are attracted to it, some aren't. So what type of speciation event, what type of isolation is occurring here? So this is Again, reproductive isolation. We've got a courtship dance. They're trying to attract a mate, so the males are trying to attract females. And if some females are attracted to the new dance, they may uh, breed and pass on that new dance, while the other ones will pass down the old one. And those two could split off into two different lineages. So moving away from natural selection, we've got genetic drift. Genetic drift is just the flow of genes towards a certain allele frequency uh, based on random chance events. So this typically happens in the much smaller populations. You can see over here we have our small population of frogs. We've got some brown ones and some green ones. You can see these brown ones. It just so happens that something happened that caused them to die, whether they were predated on or their habitat was destroyed. And these green ones continue to breed. Well, this brown trait was lost, and the green ones continue to produce more green offspring. So like I said, this is going to be random. And this can lead to things like genetic bottlenecks. Genetic bottlenecks are events where the population is going to suddenly be reduced. We have a large population of frogs, something happens, their habitat gets destroyed, some predator comes in and wipes them out, and the population plummets. As a result, these few individuals that are left are going to pass on their traits and affect the overall allele frequency in the population. So we have these new individuals. You can see the blue ones versus the red ones. We get some bottlenecking event where only red ones are, only red ones happen to survive. Again, random chance that it's all reds, but only red ones are going to survive. So the red ones are going to pass on their genes. The blue ones, since they did not survive the bottlenecking event, they don't pass on their traits, so none of the offspring of this are going to be blue. So looking at this, again, we have a large population of mix of blue and yellow. We have some sort of bottlenecking event that, re that reduces the population numbers. The surviving individuals, as they start to breed, we have a lot more blue than yellow, so this overall population is going to reflect that. It's going to have more blue individuals than yellow individuals. So based on that, Take a minute, what is the difference between genetic drift and natural selection? Why do we need to compare these two? So genetic drift is going to be random. It's going to be traits that we aren't selecting for like we are in natural selection. Natural selection, we want to pick the best trait that's always going to survive in that environment. So if we need thicker fur to survive the winter, if we need um, more succulent leaves to hold in more water in the desert. Those are going to be specifically selected for. They're beneficial to the environment. Genetic drift is completely random. So some good traits could be inherited. Some bad traits can be inherited. Some neutral, not effective traits can be in inherited. And that's going to affect how the population just overall changes. So for example, if we have a uh, disease that pops up in these frogs, that just so happens to be uh, in favor of genetic drift, the offspring get that bad trait even though it's not beneficial to the environment. They're still going to get it through random selection. So these frogs would have a more likely chance of getting some sort of disease or complication because of the effect of genetic drift. So the third one, the founder's effect, 
as you can see in this diagram, we have a large population or a mother population. We're going to take a small sample of that and we are going to create a new population. So take a minute, based on this diagram and what I just briefly explained, try to come up with a definition for the Fatter's effect. What do you think that it means? What do you think this diagram has anything to do with? So the founder's effect, if you think of founder, a founder is someone who starts something. Think um, the founding fathers in America are individuals who came together to create um, the beginning of the United States. Um, founders are people who start a new uh, thing. So we have this mother population. We take a small sample size of this and we put it in a new area. This could be a new... Uh, mountaintop, this could be a new island, this could be a new uh, batch of forest that just popped up or plains that popped up in the middle of the forest. And this population is going to go and spread its genes to the rest of the population. So this new population is going to grow and as it grows we're going to get a lot more orange individuals than we get blue individuals. Now you see in this first population we had about an even split, but because of the founders, the first individuals that came to this new call or this new population it's going to be reflective of those alleles that were passed from that original group to all the offspring so in the context of space travel this makes a lot of sense if we send a few individuals up to colonize the moon or colonize mars this new population whatever traits the parents have if we start to have children on the moon and we start to build a larger colony, those children are going to be reflective of what the original astronauts looked like. The, the traits are going to be passed on from the parents to the offspring. And the last one, and this kind of ties in, the last one is migration. So you may have seen before um, geese flying in V formation from across the sky. This is an example of migration. Migration is the movement of organ organisms from one place to another. And there's many different reasons that they can do this. For example, lots of birds will migrate to nesting grounds, to breeding grounds, so that their babies are raised and develop in a different place, a usually more safe place, like a cliffside um, or an island coast, um, a much more safer environment than where they go to feed. So they may move from place to place. They can also use it purely for survival. A lot of butterflies and a lot of birds will fly south for the winter um, if they live in higher latitudes. And they do this so that they can avoid the cold temperatures. Butterflies will die if they get into too cold temperatures. So monarch species, or monarch butterflies, will fly to Mexico uh, for the winter. And then usually over winter down there, they'll breed and then they'll come back up and lay their eggs um, in North America. They could also use it for feeding. So if you've ever looked at uh, shark trackers or different uh, ocean animal trackers, you can usually predict where feeding spots are going to be based on, a, based on that tracked movement. So uh, I know I've looked at shark trackers before. Just to, It's a lot of fun to just watch them, see where they are. Um, but you can see that if a shark or something like that is going to stay in one area, there's typically some sort of food source for them there. That's why they're hunting around. That's why they move such large distances in the ocean to kind of hunt for new food sources. So these are all different ways that we can get isolation events, different speciation events, because all of these are going to kind of apply what we learned about natural selection and kind of force them to become isolated and evolve into different niches, into different characteristics. Do real quick, another example of migration is the migration of early humans across the planet. So originally humans started out uh, development in Africa. We developed as a species in Africa. Africa at the time was a lot more uh, rainforest and um, jungle than it is now. Now it's a lot more dry, a lot more um, savanna uh, environment. And slowly over time we began to migrate. We began to move to Africa, to Europe, to Asia, 
down into Australia, and even across Asia and across the Bering Strait land bridge, the uh, at the time land bridge during the last ice age between Russia and uh, Alaska. And that's how we got down into North America and South America. So a lot of these um, ancient civilizations you hear about in um, history, whether it's the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Incans, or people, uh, indigenous people in Africa or um, in the Middle East, a lot of those came from humans diversifying and spreading across the planet. So migration of early humans, big example of us trying to spread out to find new food sources, to find new land to um, inhabit. And so this has caused or created a lot of spread across the earth, as well as diversity. Um, obviously skin color because of environments. So if you live in more tropical regions and more uh, dry regions, you're going to have darker skin versus lighter skin, um, different changes in eye color. For example, blue eyes were actually developed up north because um, there is a lot of light up north, um, especially like reflections off of snow that cause blue, eye, blue eyes are actually better adapted for higher amounts of light. So different adaptations have come as a result from humans trying to spread across the globe. So as practice, um, I kind of want to highlight one of the research projects that I did on this topic and kind of have you guys analyze it. So um, I have in college done a lot of research with these gamers mi or gamers minus or um, freshwater amphipod, if you've ever heard of a scud, that is an amphipod. Um, these are kind of like freshwater shrimp. And we analyzed in caves the different or the changes to size and um, body shape. So we looked at a couple things. We looked at the antenna length. We looked at the size of the eyes. You can see their eyes are a lot different than ours. Um, they actually have what are called ametidia. Ametidia are uh, the kind of simple eyes that combine together to form a compound eye. We looked at body length. We looked at um, leg length as kind of a control. Um, but we were trying to see how the cave environment affected these amphipods. How did they change based on populations that were found inside the cave compared to outside the cave? So I want you to uh, kind of analyze the following. So what type of isolation were the amphipods in the cave facing? So we had two populations. We had the ones found outside the cave and the ones found inside the cave. So what type of isolation would separate those two? So the second question, if natural selection was at work, what is one of the characteristic differences that you would expect to see between the cave and the outside population? What characteristic might they have lost inside the cave that they would need outside of the cave? And if amphipods are aquatic invertebrates, which they are, what type of event or what type of isolation that we talked about could occur if the river outside of the cave dried up and only a small population of the amphipods inside the cave survived? What kind of event, what would that event be called? So of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions. And of course, anything about evolution. I love talking about natural selection and how traits evolved. So if you have any questions uh, about that, feel free to email me.